getting out into the woods is thrilling in its way. On one hand, it makes you step outside and leave your problems behind. But, on the other hand, it can be dangerous because it has cliffs, natural predators, and even some unnatural predators. Most of us think that when we go on a short hike, we will be back home. Well, Rosanna Millioni, Cheryl Dunlap, Meredith Emerson, and Julie Smith all thought the same thing. Except, sadly, they couldn't make it out of the forest. The fact is, more than 10 murders in the National Forest can be traced to only one old man. They called him the National Forest Serial Killer. For 10 years, Gary Hilton stalked the backcountry trails of the southern US, leaving a trail of death in his wake. Born in November 1946, Hilton was a troubled kid. Since he was a child until he got locked up for Emerson murder at age 61, his own life and criminal history were just a mess. In 1959, 13-year-old Hilton shot his stepfather, Milo DeBag. Hilton thought DeBag had taken away his mother. Fortunately, he only hurt DeBag, but not enough to kill him. You also could tell DeBag was a forgiving man. He decided to let his stepson try again, and chose not to press charges. After the attack Hilton was taken to a mental hospital for a short time. When he got out he joined the Davy Crockett platoon. In 1963, 17-year-old Gary Hilton enlisted in the U.S. Army. He was sent to West Germany, and assigned to the Davy Crockett. The members of the Davy Crockett platoon were supposed to get screened for psychological fitness. How then, did Hilton get in? A few years into his service, Hilton started hearing voices and soon had, a full-blown schizophrenic break. The army locked him up in a mental hospital, where he was drugged up on Thorazine. And rather than a Section 8 psychiatric discharge, he got an honorable one. He got out of the army in 1967, when he was 21 years old. Hilton's illness seemed not to bother the army, so no one kept track of him, to see how he functioned in society. But Hilton was a good-looking athlete, and had a genius-level IQ, so he had a variety of choices. But whether it was his painful childhood or his deteriorating mental state, that left Hilton partially scalped. The man struggled to keep a relationship alive or keep a stable job. In the 70s and 80s, he moved around the southern states. In 1995, he got busted for stealing books from a door-to-door -door sales company. He also worked on and off for a Gwinnett County Siding Company. He handed out ads and did odd jobs. As a man, he was married at least three times, but his longest marriage was only two years and never had little Hiltons. His third wife worked as a security guard at Stone Mountain Park. It is a 3,000-acre park near Atlanta with camping, hiking, wooded trails, lakes, and family attractions. And if Hilton had one passion or anything that helped him feel safe, it would be to spend time outside. He often lived in forests and mountains, where he camped and spent most of his time. He too liked dogs, and his name was Dandy. Hilton also had legal problems that kept coming up. In 1973, he was found guilty of driving under the influence in Florida. In 1983, he was found guilty of carrying a gun without a license and of drug possession. In 1987, he was found guilty of theft and marijuana possession. And in 1995, he pleaded guilty to 21 counts of solicitation. Now, I don't really believe in coincidences, but that one is a heck of a coincidence. Since the 1980s, Rail had defended Hilton in court many times for crimes like arson, trespassing, and asking for fake donations to charity. Samuel Rail, an Atlanta lawyer and filmmaker, said that Hilton helped him come up with the story for the movie Deadly Run in 1995. The movie story is about a man who stalks, hunts, and kills women in the woods, which is similar to what Hilton did. Rail said that Hilton came up with the idea of the main character releasing women into the woods to hunt them like prey. He also helped choose the cast, and found the cabin in the woods near Cleveland, where they filmed most of the movie. Then, 13 years later, Meredith Emerson's body was found, 30 miles from the same cabin. However, while the movie was shooting, Hilton was not a suspect in any murders or disappearances. In Georgia, Hilton worked for John Tabor, a siding company owner in the Atlanta area. Tabor not only hired Hilton, but also gave him a place to stay. But soon after taking Ritalin, his demeanor started to change. Aside from his irritability, he acted out and even threatened Tabor. Soon after, 
Hilton lost his job and home on Tabor property. In 2005, roughly two years before he claimed his first victim, Hilton abandoned a van in the Trey Mountain area of White County, Georgia. Despite receiving a citation for doing so, he did not respond. But a warrant for his arrest was issued and put into the federal database. Then in 2007, with Dandy by his side, Hilton hit the road. Since he liked national parks, Hilton left Georgia in 2007 and entered North Carolina's Pisgah National Park. We don't know how he met Irene and John Bryant, but we do know that, sadly, they crossed paths. Irene Bryant, 84, and John Bryant, 80, were last seen on October 21, 2007. They drove 20 miles from their home to North Carolina's Pisgah National Forest to hike and look at the fall colors. They had been married for 58 years and loved traveling, hiking, and spending time in nature. It took time for their neighbors and family to notice they were gone since they were always on the go. On November 2nd, their son Bob reported them missing before driving to North Carolina to help look for his parents. Upon finding their car in a parking lot at the trailhead, he contacted the police. Investigators looked at Irene's bank and phone records and found that around 4 p.m., she tried calling 911, but the call didn't go through. The day after Irene tried to call 911, records showed that cash was taken out of their bank account at 7 p.m. Surveillance showed that the card was used by a thin guy in a hooded raincoat, 25 miles away in Ducktown, Tennessee. In November, Irene's body was found 100 yards away from her car, covered in leaves and sticks. She had died from a head injury, and probably had her legs and arms ripped up. But John remained missing, until his bones were found in February 2008. While all that was going on, Hilton left North Carolina and drove south again to Georgia. He stopped to set up camp in Cherokee County, on a private hunting preserve. Someone in the area saw him and called the police to complain. A deputy came to the property to tell Hilton to leave, he also checked Hilton's license against a state database. Unfortunately, there were no outstanding warrants for Hilton in the Peach State. Since the license wasn't checked on the federal database, Hilton was owed an apology and was free to go. Hilton then left Cherokee County and drove south. By mid-November he was in the Apalachicola National Forest near Tallahassee. Although Hilton had a run-in with a Park Service officer on November 17th, the officer told him not to camp in the park for more than 14 days, and again, he was not looked up in a federal database to see if he had any outstanding warrants. Even though it's not clear how Cheryl ended up in Hilton's arms, what is clear is that she was not lucky. On December 1, 2007, Hilton went to the Apalachicola National Forest along with 46 years old nurse Cheryl Dunlap. Cheryl has two grown sons, spent 20 years as a nurse and taught Sunday school. On December 1, 2007, she went hiking alone in the Apalachicola National Forest in the Florida Panhandle. Hilton took Dunlap from the Leon Sinks Geological Area of the Apalachicola National Forest, where she said she'd read a book. He probably kept her alive for a few days so he could use her ATM card and then kill her. Sure enough, he burned her head and hands in his campfire and left her car by the road. But Cheryl didn't show up for Sunday school or work, two days in a row now. Her friends suspected the worst. Three days after she went missing, her car was spotted on the side of the highway, just outside the National Forest. However, nothing of value was found when they searched the area. But police suspected foul play and checked the similarities with the previous unsolved murder. They now wanted to check her recent bank activities. A little over a week after Dunlap went missing, police released surveillance photos of a man using her ATM card on December 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. The man wore a rubber mask, gloves, and a hat. The old man maybe saw himself in the news, so he never used the card again. On December 15th, some hunters found Dunlap's headless body near Bloxham Cutoff Road. There had to be a DNA sample to prove the bones were female, because her head and hands were missing. A forestry agent ran Hilton's license plate number through the police database on December 7. It showed that he was in the area when and where Dunlap went missing. After Dunlap's body was found, a hunter said he saw Hilton driving a white van through the forest with a knife in his hand and looking like he was homeless. The hunter told Hilton not to be in the woods during hunting season. Because of this conversation the hunter was able to pick Hilton out of a group photo. 
On November 17, a forestry agent talked to Hilton and ran the tag number of his white van through a database to make sure it wasn't stolen. On December 28, another forestry agent talked to Hilton in Osceola National Forest, which is about 160 miles from where Dunlap was last seen. These sightings certainly showed that Hilton had been in the area before Dunlap's murder and had left afterwards. While there was no physical evidence linking Hilton to the crime, Investigators found audio tapes where he had recorded himself talking rudely about women and discussing hiding things. He said he was a sociopath who could separate himself from killing. While police searched the area for clues about who killed those innocent people, Hilton was already gone. He was back in Georgia at the end of 2007, just in time for New Year's Eve. Hilton and Andy went hiking on Blood Mountain outside of Atlanta on January 1, 2008. That's when he met Meredith Emerson, 24, who was also out walking with her dog on New Year's Day. The two had left their home in Buford, Georgia, to hike one of their favorite trails on Blood Mountain. Having trained in martial arts, Emerson fought back when Hilton tried to take her away. Emerson put up a good fight, but Hilton beat her in the end, thanks to his experience in the army. As soon as he had her under control, he led her down the mountain to his van. He tied Emerson up, got in his car, and drove away. For days, he kept her as a prisoner. However, on day one, people saw the pair on the mountain. And it wasn't long before the Georgia Bureau of Investigation said that Hilton was responsible for Emerson's disappearance. Even though her bank card was used at ATMs, many miles away, the police kept searching in Blood Mountain. The next day, friends and authorities looked for Emerson and Ella in the area, where they had been hiking, but neither of them could be found. On that day, a winter storm came in, and the search had to be stopped. After her disappearance made the news, people said they'd seen her hiking with a 60-year-old man and a black dog on a trail that leads from the Appalachian Trail to Reese's parking lot. One caller said that he found a police baton, water bottles, sunglasses, a dog leash, and dog treats all over an area, where the ground was scratched, and scuffed. A few minutes earlier, he spotted an older man walking with a younger woman. While the man carrying a police baton, the younger woman was holding the leash he had found. At first, he thought they were father and daughter, but these things were all over the place, and those signs of a fight definitely worried him. While he was there, he talked to a different group of hikers who had seen the man hiding in the woods. After a short search, they picked up the things and left them at a store, but they didn't call the police at the time. After hearing about Emerson's disappearance on TV the next day, he then called the police to tell them what he'd seen, and found the day before. Police also found surveillance footage of Hilton trying to use Emerson's ATM card but failing. Investigators thought Emerson was still alive, and they knew she was with Hilton, so they gave the media a copy of Hilton's DMV photo. On the same day, Ella was found wandering around in a grocery store parking lot in Cumming, Georgia, about 60 miles from where Emerson was last seen. They also found bloody clothes, bloody men's boots, and Emerson's purse and wallet in a dumpster, across the street from the store where Ella was found. A boot was also found in the dumpster, but it belonged to Cheryl Dunlap. The whole country heard about the kidnapping, and it wasn't long before John Tabor, Hilton's old boss, heard about it. When Hilton called Tabor asking for money, Tabor knew that Hilton was to blame for Emerson's disappearance. Interestingly, Tabor didn't tell the Georgia Bureau of Investigation about the call for nearly an hour. The police found the trail led to a pancake house near Blood Mountain. But, when they got there, Hilton was gone. A few days later, Hilton was seen in a parking lot in DeKalb County, throwing things out of his van and into a dumpster. Then a witness called 911, saying, I believe the guy you're looking for is cleaning out his van. DeKalb County deputies rushed to the scene, with their lights flashing and sirens wailing. This time Hilton couldn't run away. He also didn't fight back when the police took him into custody. Soon Hilton was in a room with the GBI, being questioned. He said in short bursts that he had killed Emerson, and he wanted to work out a deal. Hilton would get life in prison without the chance of getting out if he gave a full confession and led Georgia police to Emerson's body. 
During almost five hours of questioning, Hilton described how Emerson yelled and used her martial arts skills to fight back. She almost got away but when she lost her balance and fell, he was able to catch her. He also said that they had hiked together for a while before she got ahead of him. He then stopped and waited for her down the trail. He planned to steal her ATM card as she was walking back to her car. He then drove her to several banks and tried to use her ATM without success. Meredith was giving him the wrong pins on purpose to buy time. Unfortunately, neither the banks nor the police noticed that Emerson's ATM cards had been used or tried to be used until January 4. Helton finally gave up and drove Emerson to a remote place when he got tired of waiting for the right pin. So he told Emerson he was taking her home. He did admit though that he knew he couldn't let her go because she'd seen his face and car and knew so much about him. Instead he tied her to a tree and hit her over the head with a car jack handle several times until she was dead. He then cut off her head and arms and put leaves over her body. The cold old man then drove more than an hour to another wooded area where he dumped her head. He couldn't kill Ella, so he let her go. On January 30, 2008, Gary Hilton admitted to killing Emerson and was sentenced to life in prison with the chance of parole after 30 years. However, after getting his life in Georgia and avoiding the death penalty, Florida investigators weren't about to let him go. Basically, in Florida, if you kill somebody, they give you a million dollar defense with all kinds of experts, then the jury convicts you and the judge sentences you to death. It's what happened when convicted serial killer Gary Hilton went on trial in February 2010. In 2010, Hilton was sentenced to death, but the case did not come to an end with his death. Flash forward to January 2016, when a judge in Tallahassee was supposed to hear Gary Hilton's request for a new trial, and by a vote of 8 to 1, the Supreme Court struck down Florida's death penalty law. It was like Hilton had a reprieve. Indeed, justice has a funny way of working out, even for a killer as dangerous as Hilton. That's all we have to say about that sick old man. And when you go out in the woods, please always be prepared. Be on the lookout for flash floods and forest fires. Make sure you're ready for rabid animals or starving beasts. But most importantly, be prepared for nature-loving serial killers.